Hi, my name is Jessica with Clink Wine Education and Entertainment, and I'll be your host for today's virtual wine class. Now, today's class is entitled Wine 102 and builds off of last month's Wine 101 class. Last month's class focused on the basics of wine tasting and really engaging your senses to enhance every sip of wine that you take. Today's class is going to build off of that foundation and focus on some of the tools such as glassware and other items that will both enhance your home wine bar, elevate your presentation as a wine event host at home, and can make some amazing gifts for the wine lover in your life this season. We'll be covering a few tips on wine storage and service depending on how much etiquette you want to uh, incorporate, as well as uh, get into a little bit about wine and food pairing. So to start out with, clearly, uh, the world of wine glassware is as diverse as the world of wine itself and can be quite confusing. However, there are a few very simple standards to keep in mind when choosing your home wine glassware especially if you are interested in continuing your wine tasting exploration. So first and foremost, we have a couple of standard glasses here I wanted to highlight. Um, so your key components, if, even if you're just going to choose one type of glass to have at home, is going to be first and foremost, as many colors and beautiful designs exist, uh, they make great gifts, but a standard clear glass is gonna be best for enabling you to fully see the wine as you're tasting and be able to tell its color and clarity for educational purposes along your wine journey. You also wanna make sure that you have an ample bowl. So about 10 ounces or more, uh, because you're going to be pouring three to five ounces and you really want this extra space in your glass to enable the aromatics after that swirling to really get kind of caught in this space for your nose to access. Along the same lines, having a slightly tapered top like this will encourage those aromatic vapors to stay in your glass. And uh, on that note, we do have a couple samples of some standard glassware. Incorporated in your notes for today's class are some uh, standard wine glass styles with pictures. Um, so today, because unfortunately, uh, despite my wine passion, I don't have space for as many glasses I have uh, as I would like, but we do have a few different uh, examples here. So first and foremost, aside from the key components of clarity, ample bowl, also we'll get to the stem conversation in a moment, uh, but definitely a little bit lighter, thinner glass is generally recommended just to really keep the focus on the wine and to avoid a thick rimmed lip, uh, one of those lips that kind of folds in, which just creates a little bit of uh, aggressiveness in the wine as it enters your mouth. So just a small tip there. Here we have our two most standard uh, different styles of wine glass. So it's a little hard to see. Uh, so here we have what's called a burgundy style glass. And I'll try and center this. As you can see, this particular style glass has a wider base a wider base at the bottom of the bowl and tapers in towards the top. Um, it creates a very similar style to what is considered uh, a burgundy wine bottle. So any wine that comes in this slender shaped sloped uh, style shoulder generally is going to be served more in your burgundy glass. They tend to be either Pinot Noirs or as in this case a Nebbiolo, some other form of a light, uh, light bodied red wine. The other classic wine glass style is called a Bordeaux, and it has a slightly taller, uh, more boxy shape. This is going to be best for your fuller bodied red wines, your Bordeaux, Cabernet, even uh, singular varietals of Bordeaux like Malbec, Petit Verdot, as well as some fuller bodied Zinfandels uh, and varietals such as that. So we got our classic wine glass, uh, if you're going for one for your house, burgundy glasses, Bordeaux glasses, a couple notes on white wine glasses. So 
So generally speaking, white wine glasses are going to be a slightly smaller version of your Bordeaux glass. However, there are also several glasses in the white category that do have a slightly wider rim. They bow out a bit and you'll see it's a slightly shorter bowl. Um, in this case, this is more or less a standard Chablis or Riesling glass, but it is also very versatile. However, I do highly recommend getting something smaller or just sticking with a standard that has a slightly tapered end. All right, so moving away from our classic white and red categories. Of course, we have a couple of sparkling wine examples. Uh, in your notes, you'll see two different uh, classic examples. This is going to be a flute glass. As you can see, this nice, long, tapered top. Uh, this length on the glass is going to maintain the bubbles and effervescence, aka perlage, in your sparkling wines not only enabling you to in, engage your senses again in the sight and beauty of watching those bubbles travel up your glass, but it'll also contain, maintain that effervescence in your wine as you're sipping it. Last and not least, uh, some dessert wine options. So dessert wines are classically poured in about a half uh, amount as a regular glass, so two, maybe three ounces. So it is best to have a nice small style of glass, um, not white wine glasses, but this actually gives you two different uh, styles. This wider body is traditional for white dessert wines, such as Sauterne, and this one is a classic port uh, Riedel glass. Uh, again, sometimes the stems are a little bit shorter as well to kind of uh, create diversity in your placeware setting. but. Feel free to play around and you don't have to be holden to white and red as long as you have perhaps a smaller glass um, just because that pour is going to look really minuscule um, in a glass of this size. And you're going to get a lot more nose out of it realistically in this size glass when you're tasting. So that gives us a little basis on glassware. Now the last note I wanted to make is on the stem versus stemless conversation. Now, while swirling a glass, and it is very true that hopefully the temperature of wine at service, and we'll get into that a bit in a moment, uh, is appropriate. And so you don't want to heat the wine with your hands. So that's why we have the stem, so you're not cupping the bowl. However, uh, I quite often travel with glassware for events, and I, of course, keep quite a bit of extra on hand for breakage purposes. And these stems, especially when washing them or polishing them, can be quite fragile. So I found that a stemless glass can be very versatile and useful. Again, we have quite a similar bowl shape. Um, a, that slight taper at the top really matters to me. Uh, again, so that you can have that access to those aromatics once you swirl and you can get your nose in there, but it's keeping that aromatic inside the glass. So in this case, I highly have no problem, I guess, against any kind of stemless wear, clearly, um, but you are going to want to be aware of and perhaps communicate to your guests that it perhaps is best to hold the glass toward the top and gently swirl this way so as not to put your hands on the wine itself and heat the bowl. So that's an option if you uh, feel like uh, you might be clumsy like I can be. Uh, I believe that does it about for now as far as glassware. Again, the conversation is as varied as the world of wine, so play around with glasses. However, uh, you don't need to feel like you need to stock your home with 10 different kinds as well. Moving on to a few other key uh, tools to have for your home wine bar. Uh, first and foremost, I like to make note of my favorite perfect wine opener. So what, whether you're a professional or not, I will say that getting used to and comfortable with a very classic, what's called a uh, server key or a wine key, uh, classically made by Pull Tap, I believe is the brand, uh, they do tend to be the most durable, the most uh, sleek for uh, service in your hand as well as storing anywhere. But some of the key components are this hinged tip. If you can see this 
Uh, again, you have a double hinge here. That's gonna give you a lot more leverage potential while opening a bottle. Also, a nice sharp, small, and I prefer serrated blade uh, is going to enable the cut to come out much cleaner and <laughs> be a little less dangerous. Sorry, my cat likes to involve herself in these videos. Apologies. Um, aside from that, also a serviette for making sure that you can wipe the top of any red bottles, especially catch any drips. Highly recommend that. Uh, serviette is basically just a cloth napkin, generally a dark color or black to hide some of those stains. Um, moving forward, again, on the gift giving level, we have one of my favorite items, a uh, wine funnel with sieve. So we're gonna get a little bit into, I'm gonna do a demo on decanting a bottle as well as opening sparkling wine. So we'll talk about the couple of the tools involved first. So if you are decanting a bottle, there are a few reasons that we do this. First and foremost is to aerate the wine. Literally add a little extra oxygen. As you can see, even if you get a standard style uh, decanter, I definitely recommend a big base like this. Uh, what this does is enable the wine to splay across the surface area of the glass as it pours into the decanter. And this provides a lot more aeration to the wine <laughs> itself, um, giving it a little more uh, aromatic lift, basically opening up the wine to enable you to access those aromatics, as well as soften the tannins and palate. So it'll be a softer, much more aromatically expressive wine. I think we can all agree that that's a great thing. Now, in addition to a decanter, and when I get to the decanting process, I'll show you exactly how this one works. Um, and there are many different styles of decanters. Again, in your notes, I've included a few different styles uh, with some images as well. And I'll include a few uh, infographics at the end of this video, uh, just because I think that they go far beyond my graphic design ability, uh, but Wine Folly Online is fabulous for some very straightforward, quick visual references if you need a little bit more to enhance this lesson. That's it. another item we have is the wine funnel and sieve. So as you can see, it's generally two parts. This makes it a lot easier for cleaning as well as gives you options. Another reason that we decant a bottle is sometimes because we've either broken the cork off and there are bits of cork uh, in the wine itself, or if it's either a very full-bodied, especially unfiltered red, or an older red wine, you will have sediment that you might not want actually incorporated into your glass. So either a, a sieve, a little strainer over your funnel, works very well for just making sure that you don't get that sediment into your decanter itself or into your glass. You can also um, use the process of allowing the bottle to sit uh, straight up just on a counter like this for about an hour or so to help a lot of that sediment settle to the bottom and then pour very slowly and forego that last half an inch or so. Um, that's the most restrained way of avoiding that additional sentiment, sediment. However, the sieve makes it, of course, a lot easier. In addition to the funnel and sieve, this particular design, a lot of uh, wine funnels incorporate this, has an additional aerator. There are actually little tiny holes punched at the very bottom here. So when the wine comes out in the decanter, since I'm not pouring it along the side of the glass to allow it to fully uh, space out along the glass itself, this will basically force it out to the sides. So we'll see that in a moment. One other note uh, before we get into some demonstrations is this fabulous uh, device that I think is necessary not only for home use, but especially during the holidays. If you are planning to pop any bottles of sparkling wine, as we will be in just a moment, you are definitely gonna want a champagne slash sparkling wine stopper. These have a lot more pressure and will actually grip the top of the bottle. Since uh, 
sparkling wine is under pressure, you, you probably have noticed the corks splay out and they're much uh, wider than the bottle itself. So you can't push it back into the bottle. Putting a regular cork back in is a, a good backup go-to, but this is going to definitely uh, ensure that the pressure is kept in the bottle so that while you're sipping along slowly during your evening, or if you decide to uh, save a couple of glasses for the next day, this will help you preserve the bubbles specifically in the wine. So very important if you are a, a sparkling wine fan. Another item that I mention, uh, just more so because of my own interest and fascination, if you are interested in continuing your wine tasting journey or you have a wine lover in your life, I love some of the new items on the market, such as my blind tasting sock monkey. You can find, I'm sure, lots of ideas along the same line uh, from Pinterest to make at home. And of course, if you're doing blind tastings, just using a paper bag or foil works as well. However, what a great gift for your next wine lover to incorporate uh, a little go-to reusable blind tasting uh, item, such as the Sock Funky. They also make wonderful uh, burlap sacks or otherwise that you can play around with at home. Uh, but that I, I just like always to mention as well. That said, I'm going to get right into the demonstration here in just a moment. Uh, first, I would like to make just a couple of notes on storage. So not only if you happen to be stocking up for the holidays or get that special bottle as a gift or are sending one to someone as a gift, these are all going to be things to keep in mind. So first and foremost, both in terms of service and storage, you really want to maintain a consistent temperature in the wine. So rapid cooling or rapid heating is never a good thing for a bottle and can throw it way out of balance, creating a little disarray with its molecular structure even. Um, so temperature is key. As far as service temperatures, those are specifically listed in your notes, but for storage, generally about 55 to 65 degrees is ideal. If you have access or are looking for a Christmas gift that perhaps involves a wine fridge, I highly recommend it. The temperature and humidity control goes a long way if you are looking to lay anything down, store for uh, more than a few months even. However, key components would be keep it out of uh, light so that you aren't getting that extra temperature. If you are keeping it in your home, you wanna make sure you keep it inside your home, not in the garage or an outside storage unit where again, outside temperatures will fluctuate even more drastically. Uh, inside the home, ideally 70 degrees, maybe 75 is very uh, reasonable. However, once you get over 80, you're going to start cooking your wine, and that's never a good thing. So about 65, 70 degrees, if you're keeping it in your house um, on a, a wine rack or in a shelf somewhere. Another very important component is to avoid vibrations. So please don't keep your cute wine rack on top of your refrigerator, as nice as that sounds. The constant vibration of the refrigerator, it will definitely do damage to your wines. The last component to keep in mind is actually the direction of the bottle. So especially if it's something that's under a natural cork, if it's under a screw top or a synthetic cork, it's not as important, but you do want to keep the bottle on its side or just slightly elevated, mostly so that the natural cork itself stays moist. If the cork itself continues to get dry as it would in this uh, direction without any wine uh, integrating into it, the cork will dry out and then continue to contract and allow even more air to access the wine itself and again start that oxidation process way too early. So keep your bottle out of the light, away from vibration, ideally at 65 degrees, but just not drastic temperature changes, and hopefully on its side. 
Now, temperature is certainly something to keep in mind as far as travel goes as well. So I don't recommend shipping wine in the middle of the summer, especially to hot climates, such as Arizona, where I happen to be. Um, and do make sure to insulate the wine well to, again, avoid that uh, vibration and uh, access to light. So there we have a little bit of coverage on glassware, some additional tools to use or give as gifts, and a little bit on storage. So we'll go ahead and get to service in just a moment with some demonstrations on sparkling wine and decanting. Okay, so moving into some tips on service. First, we'll go ahead and start with our sparkling wine demonstration. Uh, whether you are opening a champagne, a cava, which in this case I am, or Prosecco, so long as it's not under a screw top, uh, a regular screw top bottle, all these same rules will apply. Now, your notes are going to be very technical because I do happen to use that outline for some uh, professional restaurant training as well, but we'll cover some of the main tips now. So first and foremost, most often a sparkling wine bottle will have an actual little pull tab on it to help you remove the foil. Uh, in a professional setting for kind of ease and quickness, because sometimes it can be a little difficult to get the pull tab, uh, you can always use your wine key knife and cut around the foil. However, in this case, we'll go ahead and just remove that foil top. Now, remember, sparkling wines are under a lot of pressure. So first and foremost, do not touch that little metal cap until you make sure that you're pointing the bottle away from any guests, ideally any windows, and you wanna actually make sure that your thumb is fully around that top and you are gripping it pretty tight. You're not going to actually move that, remove that metal cage until the bottle is open. Now, all bottles have a six turn rule, so you'll hold the bottle at a 45 degree angle to help the effervescence escape properly. You have six twists. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're gonna loosen the cage, keep your finger, your thumb tight on that cork. You're gonna grip the cork and the bottle top at the same time, and you'll actually twist the bottle itself. So you're gonna gently coerce the cork out and create a nice little seeping sound. Notice no bubbles. Hopefully they're all still in the wine so they'll be in your glass. I know it doesn't look as exciting as a bottle popping for New Year's, but believe me, it will make your wine taste that much better and then there's no loss. So here we go with our beautiful open bottle of wine. We'll go ahead and pour. As you notice, as soon as you start pouring those bubbles come up really aggressive. If you pour a tiny bit in the glass, it's called tempering your glass. You can go ahead and pour a second pour and you'll notice the bubbles don't quite build up as fast and you can actually go ahead and fill a perfect sparkling for New Year's or otherwise. Now, since I'm gonna go ahead and save this bottle for after my yoga class tonight, I'm going to use my handy dandy sparkling wine stopper push and tighten. It's that easy and now we have a nice bottle of sparkling wine to enjoy. So cheers to our first bottle opening. Now second, aside from going over a little bit on um, just standard bottle opening because I know a lot of you out there might still have some of the electronic versions or otherwise. And if that works for you, great. If you're ever looking to experiment with a classic wine key, a couple of tips also, if you happen to purchase an older bottle of wine, one thing that's kind of lesser known is you do want to actually cut the foil underneath that bottom lip. Uh, a lot of the foil cutters will cut directly on top 
and that's fine for home use, but by cutting the bottle underneath that bottom lip, you're making sure to remove that much more excess foil, so you're A, not getting any foil in your wine or bottle, and also, for older vintage bottles, you may have a little residual mildew or otherwise that may not have affected the wine at all, but will be on the lip of the bottle. So you want to make sure to have that serviette so that you can go ahead and wipe that off. Also, if there happens to be any sediment. In this case, we're fine. Now I'm going to show you a few different ways to use a decanter, or in this case, this decanter for our purposes. So first and foremost, I always take my wine key and go straight over the top and you want to go just off center. Get it down pretty much all the way. I always, I'm right handed, so I make sure that the wine key is on this side so that I can go ahead and fold over, use that top hinge and just bootstrap it up. Again, nice clean pull. It is highly recommended if you do have any residual cork or sediment, again, use your serviette to give it a little bit of a wipe. Go ahead and leave this. Uh, highly recommend, recommend a lot of things. Uh, take a small taste before you decant because if your wine is corked, you don't want to uh, spread that taint to your decanter itself. So give it a nice sniff just to make sure that it's solid. And then we have a couple of options. So if you have just a standard decanter, it may look like this. It may have a slightly taller top. This is a particular type of decanter we'll go over in a moment. Uh, you're going to want to tilt it and pour along the very side of the decanter so that you're really accessing a lot of that glass on the side of the decanter as well. And you'll see it kind of waterfall along. In the case of using the wine funnel, with or without the filter. In this case, I don't think we need it. I'm not sure how best. But you can see how it actually sp sprays out of these small holes on the side to really create that wine waterfall, again, along the sides of your decanter. Now, a third decanter variation, which is perhaps why I purchased this one myself. Um, it, this actually comes with a small topper that allows you, I'm going to have to do this just in case. Allows you to actually take the decanter itself, place it on top of your bottle, and then do a quick flip. Again, you can see how beautifully that's water falling along the sides of the decanter. We're going to go ahead and pour the entire bottle into our decanter. Take just another moment. Do a little shake. <laughs> Almost there. And, and once again, since I'm not going to enjoy this until after yoga or tomorrow, you can actually go ahead and flip the entire decanter over and it'll automatically re-decant itself back into the bottle. So in this case, I'm doing this for a slightly youthful bottle of Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo is a classic light-bodied grape that does tend to be fairly tight and tannic in its youth. So it's highly uh, advised to go ahead and decant it. It'll definitely give you a better aromatic experience and just soften that palate. A Nebbiolo can certainly be decanted, especially in this way where you're giving it that aeration and then returning it to the bottle where it's not going to access a whole lot more air so long as I put that cork back in. We're going to go ahead and take this right off. <laughs> 
and now I have a perfectly decanted bottle that's had a little bit of air given to it. I can go ahead and enjoy that with dinner tonight and it'll already be open or save it for tomorrow or bring it to a friend's house, but with a little bit of that decanting uh, love going into it. And yet this is also great for if you are hosting a home tasting or have a few different bottles that you want to enjoy throughout your dinner and don't want to necessarily dirty or have on hand multiple decanters. Uh, you can also go ahead and use the funnel itself to return a wine to the bottle one way or the other. So we'll go ahead and leave this off to the side here. Okay, so just a few more notes on, uh, as I said, food and wine pairing. So included in your notes are both these top principles that we're going to talk about just now, as well as quite a long list of some classic pairings. But first and foremost, when thinking about food and wine pairing, you want to match weight. So I like to think of weight in terms of different milks and creams. Non-fat, reduced fat, full fat, buttermilk, heavy cream. Um, you can feel that weight in your mouth. If you think of something like a Pinot Grigio, it, is, it tends to be much more watery. It's definitely that non-fat milk type of weight. If you think of something like a full oaked buttery Chardonnay, still a white wine, still a brighter acid, definitely less tannin, but it has a lot more of that weight. So first and foremost, you really want to match the weight in your wines uh, with the weight in your dish. So even if you're serving a light fish filet, but you're covering it with a heavy cream sauce, you're going to want a white wine, for instance, that has a lot more of that richness to match that weight. Second key component of food and wine pairing is tannin. So tannin is that gritty feel that you might get in your mouth when drinking, especially red wines. Tannin's very tricky and can really compete with a lot of different foods, specifically a lot of salt, creamy sauces, and light, light white fish or light seafood. All of these foods are going to really highlight the astringency and bitterness in the tannin and make it feel a lot rougher and almost more sour in your mouth. On the other hand, tannin goes harmoniously with fatty foods, proteins, anything with sinew and meat fats, which is why a big tannic Cabernet Sauvignon goes so fabulously with a grilled ribeye. Now, third key component of food and wine pairing is acid. Now, acid is an interesting category because it can really go two different ways. One, the acid in the wine that you're drinking can act just like a squeeze of lemon and cut right through some of the richness that you might otherwise be tasting, whether it's a fried food or a rich creamy sauce. Sometimes you want that extra acid in your wine as a complement, much the way you would add a little bit of lemon to a fish filet. Now, the other direction to go is to make sure that you're matching acid in your food. You want to make sure that if you are eating something like a bright tomato sauce or a light acidic vinaigrette with a salad, that your wine itself has enough acidity to match that. Um, otherwise, the acid itself is going to overpower the wine that you're tasting. Now, the fourth component would be sweetness. Again, kind of an interesting component. When we talk about sweetness in a wine, we can think about dessert wines like port. And when you're talking about pairing dessert wines with dessert, you actually want to make sure that your dessert wine has a little bit higher, if not at least as much sugar and sweetness as your dessert itself. Now, this can be a little bit difficult in America with some of our cakes. Uh, so don't be afraid to experiment with some really high sugar dessert wines or late harvest wines with some of your desserts this holiday season. The other direction to go is your sweet or just off dry wines that also are really beneficial to tempering spice, hotness, 
rich, that type of spiciness in uh, cuisine. So if you are experimenting at home with some cooking and some Asian dishes, Indian dishes, or otherwise that tend to have a little bit higher heat ratio, um, try out a nice off-dry Riesling or Gewürztraminer, even a Chenin Blanc with your next uh, Chinese takeout and ch see just how that sugar uh, both complements and tempers your palate as you're eating through something that may or may not be uh, quite to your liking depending on its heat level. Um, other than that, I highly recommend once again to experiment with food and wine. Uh, try out a bottle of sherry or tawny port uh, with some of your hors d'oeuvres and appetizers this season, or even a glass of Moscato Diosti as an appetizer instead of a dessert wine. You'd be surprised how versatile some of these lesser known wines can be, uh, especially during a holiday season when we're, we're sharing and trying new things, hopefully. So aside from our decanting and sparkling wine, I hope that you will be popping some bottles this holiday season. Uh, maybe this has given you some good gift ideas. And if you have any questions, I encourage you to check out my website. It's clinkwineedu.com or you can email me at clinkwine at gmail.com. Again, my name is Jessica. It's been a pleasure hosting today's class. Cheers to your holiday season.